I think we all know people who have physical allergies. One individual cannot eat strawberries, but the most un inconvenient allergy that I know recorded was when a wife became allergic to her husband. <laughs> no emotional factors involved, completely chemical. So you never know where an allergy is going to show up. In fact, we all have some of them. Today, the greatest attention is being given to food allergies. And uh, already more than 250 types of allergy have been found and assigned to their proper causes. Of course, our ancestors knew nothing about this, which probably was a great help, because they lived simply, ate normal food that had been honestly prepared, and went along with only an occasional outburst in which a particular product was especially offensive. But while we have been going along thinking a lot about food allergies and pollen allergies and uh, climatic difficulties, we have forgotten that there are also allergies that affect the mental and emotional lives of people. You can have an, a mental allergy just as easily as you can have a physical one. In fact, a great deal of unhappiness is the result of the unsuspected fact that the psychic integration of the individual is very sensitive, easily disturbed, and very often annoyed. Under these conditions, it's interesting and perhaps profitable to study a little bit to see if we can trace the processes within ourselves which might result in or have or has resulted in uh, an allergic reaction to circumstances. The first thing we have to do is to sit down rather quietly and try to decide what most frequently upsets us. Uh, an upset psyche is very much like an upset stomach. It can be very annoying and, if not corrected, will continue to develop until it can become a, so, a, such a firm part of the personality that we have to live with it the rest of our lives. So we can try, if possible, to determine matters that are particularly difficult for us to face and yet are not especially serious in themselves. One of the more common problems we have today is our allergic reaction to world conditions. There's hardly anyone who hasn't found contemporary circumstances indigestible. We are concerned over the problems of nations, and we take upon ourselves very personally situations we can do nothing about. One of the problems, of course, is to trace uh, our allergic reaction to world affairs to see if we can decide which particular part of our own nature is most likely to become involved. Our allergies are not consistent any more than the food allergies are. They uh, do not follow well-regulated patterns. They nearly always arise where there is a powerful element in the personality itself. In food allergies, the system tells us what we can eat. And in emotional and mental allergies, the mind or the emotions decide what we will accept or reject. And where rejection comes in, there's always discomfort of some kind. So we must try to discover, if possible, how to cope with certain difficulties of temperament. The easiest way to approach this, of course, is to watch yourself for a few days and note down things that especially annoy you, situations that you say, I just can't stand, or if you, if you have people you know that you hope will never visit you again. <laughs> Why? What have they done 
to become a nuisance to your psyche? How have they offended your psychic digestive system so that you find it convenient to ignore them? Now in the physical phase of matters, we are warned against junk foods. But in matters of psychic allergy, we have to go much further than this. Even physical allergy can go into climate. It can cause individuals to be uncomfortable and sick simply by being in an atmosphere that displeases them. Hot and cold can prove allerg allergic to people. Some like hot weather, some like cold weather. Some prefer the mountains and others the desert. What these preferences are may be difficult to examine, but we must try to do what we can. If in your daily living there is nothing that upsets you, that you can just take everything as it comes in good grace and good spirit, avoiding no responsibility that is yours and taking on none for other people, you may say that you are comparatively healthy psychologically, that you have every reason to be grateful, that you have been given a mind and an emotional nature which is minding its own business and is concerned with the principal and regular problems of living. If, however, you find that it's very easy to upset you, then remember that it is very easy to upset the stomach with the wrong food. Also, if you find out that the things that upset you, like junk foods in the stomach, are not really very important. They are trivial, and most people react more violently to trivial things than they do to major events. Very often we can meet almost any emergency with grace, but small irritations, like allergies, are constant discomforts and annoyances. Why do we have certain feelings about things? Why do we have prejudices? Why is it that situations arise that we can't endure? Why was it that every time President Ulysses S. Grant listened to music, it made him sick? He was allergic to music. He was even more allergic when in the White House they wanted him to dance to it. That was nearly the finish of the poor man. <laughs> So, almost anything can cause an, a psychic allergy, wallpaper, furnishings, conversation, the tones of persons' voices, weather. All these things have a tendency to get at us and to do things to us that are not particularly fortunate. Now, it is obvious that in many instances we cannot change circumstances. We cannot avoid completely everything that seems disagreeable to us. We must therefore go after those things which can be corrected and do all that is possible to improve the situation. We are also often unaware of a psychic allergy. We do not realize that we have it. We live with it sometimes a lifetime without finding out what it is. This can happen with food also, or uh, with uh, pollen allergy. It can come from perfumes. Some people are allergic to tobacco smoke. Others are allergic to an electric iron because of the steam that comes out of it. It is almost impossible to determine all these physical factors. And it is also very difficult to work with all of the psychological factors. Many persons simply settle down and endure them the best they can for their lifetimes. But it's not necessary to be so completely patient or to just go on doing something that could be changed for the better. So we'll assume for the moment that you are going to try to find out what irritates you. And as you go along, you must try to decide to what degree these irritations are genuine and to what degree they are imaginary in your own life. 
I know people who are t uh, terribly annoyed by telephone ringing. Even though they want to receive the messages, they, all, they always seem to come at the wrong moment when the individual is not ready to talk or doesn't feel like going to the phone. Others do not uh, like uh, doorbells. Many are allergic to the arrangements of groceries in a market. If the, if the groceries were on shelf 5 for a while and suddenly disappear and appear on shelf 12, there is a minor catastrophe in the human emotional structure. We are nearly all today allergic to prices. Merely to mention them very often will cause a major disturbance of the psychic integration. Now, as we go along with some of these matters, it becomes obvious that what cannot be cured must be endured. And the proper attitude of acceptances can do a great deal to benefit the situation. Now, in food allergies, acceptances may be in the form of stomatic medications. An individual who has certain difficulties can take certain remedies for these difficulties and enjoy greater comfort. The same is true in psychological allergies. The individual can rearrange his affairs so that he can endure his dislikes with greater grace. Now, if you have a tendency to worry about this, sit down and estimate in your own mind the value of an antagonism or an antipathy. Try to find out what it costs to take an attitude that is essentially unhealthy. What do you gain? Uh, with a food allergy, you may enjoy a dessert and be prepared to stand the results. But with a psychic allergy, there's very often no dessert to enjoy first. There is simply a difficulty that has no rewarding factors unless the mind itself changes. This is probably where natural law steps in. We are supposed to control and discipline our natures. And if we do not do these uh, things correctly, then the body or the mind or the emotions will be disoriented. The person will suffer because he has failed to keep the rules governing the circumstances which annoy him. He suffers because he cannot have his own way in a universe in which finally his only out, his only security lies in following the way of heaven. We cannot stand against inevitables. We shouldn't even try. When an inevitable comes along, we must try to learn its lesson. We must escape from its penalties by transmuting our own relation to the, to the incidents. If the things cannot be changed, we have two choices. One is to depart from the situation as gracefully as possible and just give up trying. The other answer is to take the situation and ask ourselves very simply, what does it mean to me and how can it help me to grow? How can I learn to grow above an allergy? How can I finally come into a peaceful relationship with that which I have normally disliked. Now, if the thing you dislike is bad, you're not supposed to come into a peaceful relationship with it. You're supposed to simply leave it alone. But if it is good but difficult, or has possibilities of being important education-wise, then the problem is to work it out through an understanding of life. This is where philosophy comes along. Philosophy is a kind of a metaphysical system of dietetics. It has a me method of providing nutrition to the inner life of the individual. Now, we will find that there is no complete conformity as to what nutrition anybody needs. But there is our general rule proving conclusively that the test of nutrition is its result. If the, if the nutrition physically helps the situation, it is right. If it makes further difficulty, it is not right. If an effort to solve a condition in life improves that condition, then we're on the right track. If it does not improve the condition or makes it worse, 
then our remedy is not effective. We are not doing the thing correctly, or we are not following the way of heaven as far as that incident is concerned. Actually, philosophy cuts through most of all human relationships and attitudes. It gives us a commanding relationship with life. It helps us to do those things which are proper and necessary, provides us with a proper explanation of why we should keep the rules, and also provides us a series of rather firm rules through the application of which we can correct most of the defects of living. Now one problem, that, for instance, that we have in psychic life is a natural tendency within ourselves to be terribly egocentric. Every person, practically, thinks in terms of self. In some mysterious way, as a personality, we are mixed up in our own conduct, too intimately and often too irrationally. We do want so desperately to do what we want to do that we regard all interference as objectionable. Anything that interferes with the fulfillment of our own desire becomes an adversary. And if it is a person, that person becomes an enemy, or at least we have no longer any interest in them. We do not have much interest in anything that is different or differs intellectually or morally from our own personal code. Now this presents itself as a real challenge because for the most part we are all better off when we have some contact with things about which we do not agree. It is very important to have an occasional disagreement but this disagreement should be intelligent. It should mean that we will consider the other person's point of view. And this is the most difficult thing of all. And one uh, prominent businessman is said to have spoken about this subject in a club talk. He said, we have to get, ri we have to get along with those stupid people who do not agree with us. <laughs> Now, if we can't get along, then we are uh, allergic to the stupid people who do not agree with us. Now the question arises whether this is an, an unmitigated disaster or whether there's something in it that is very useful. One of the ways we all have to grow is by contact with the unfamiliar. We go along doing the same things until they be very, come very comfortable. But the life has a tendency to stagnate. We have a tendency to drift through to the end of our years without adding very much to the dimensions of our consciousness. If, however, we are challenged, the challenge is like waking an individual who is sleeping comfortably. But it is not possible to grow as well asleep as it is awake. So the individual who becomes aware of circumstances he had never understood before has an opportunity to grow. Now these circumstances, whatever they may be, have a tendency to be in conflict with the comfortable consequences of comparative mental indolence. If the person has been getting along the way he wanted to, if his friends tolerate him, if he has his own way, and if in an argument it becomes easier to keep quiet than argue with him, this person has a tendency to feel that life is just about what it ought to be. But he will live this way and probably ultimately depart this way, and is very doubtful if he goes to a better world whether he'll be any happier there than he is here because he's going to find fault with something. But uh, if this same individual realizes that these differences of opinions which act as irritations are much like what the Greeks called the gadfly of Zeus. The great deity Zeus had a fly that was always stinging people and made them uncomfortable. They were always swatting at it, but it got away. 
And these, this gadfly is more or less a personification of the irritations which arise within us. This gadfly is the constant contact with people who will not do exactly what we want them to do, who do not agree that we have infallible attitudes, or that we know exactly the right color for the wallpaper. These people do not agree, and they would not agree with us, and we would not agree with them. So the problem rises of living in a constant relationship with people that is damaged by this de determined effort of each person to convert somebody else. If this problem has arisen in your life, and if you find that you gradually lose friendships, or lose opportunities, or even lose employment because of attitudes, then you have an, a psychological allergy that is very well worth working on and trying to overcome. Actually, we have to go back to philosophic principles in order to fully understand the life we live. Among these principles, perhaps the most important one to remember is that we are here to grow. We are not here uh, to rusticate. We are not here like bulbs in the ground simply to wait till the sun causes us to sprout. We are here to grow by intent and purpose. We come into this world with a certain endowment. This endowment is very much like the biblical statement of the talents. And these are talents in one sense of the word, not coins, but specialized abilities. We come into this world with potential for growth. And a successful life is the one in which this potential is made real in action. The individual who is able to live throughout his lifetime without changing his mind on any subject is the most dismal failure of all. Because no one at the present time is wise enough to be able to go through life without improving and at the same time fulfill the destiny for which he was intended. So we have to begin by assuming that we are going to live in a world which is not going to agree with us in everything, a world in which other people will try to do to us what we are desperately trying to do to them. When we do it is an act of wisdom. When they do it is a very unpleasant occurrence. One more problem that we have to take from natural law is that nature reserves health, happiness, peace of mind, security for individuals who make corrections in their own dispositions. No one can be happy as long as the ability and capacity for unhappiness is strong within him. A person who is unhappy will not become any happier unless he changes himself. The idea of depending on other people is a mistake. In modern life, we are making a grand mistake. We are assuming that happiness is something that we can buy. We are assuming that happiness is prosperity in economic matters. We are assuming that we can achieve internal security, peace of mind, and peace of heart by increasing our worldly possessions. As means of improving our characters, wealth of all kinds, possessions, things, luxuries, must be considered junk foods. They are not sources of any strength. They are sources of gratification of all kinds of uncorrected attitudes within ourselves. We are not here to hope that the gratification of the accumulative instinct is going to solve any problems that we possess. If we have no problems and they're getting along fine with everything we have, it's not going to be very easy to change. But nature, fortunately, does not allow any life to run its entire length without challenge. It, there has to be a certain amount of growth. And if nature finds it's impossible 
to achieve growth in an individual than a kind of articular sclerosis, auricular sclerosis takes in. We have no further growth. We have no further advancement, and we begin to decline, dry up, and finally blow away. There has to be growth, and the growth is interfered with by the individual who locks himself against it. A form of uh, uh, allergy psychologically is therefore self-centeredness, selfishness, and the will to do what one pleases at all cost and regardless of consequences. This kind of life is bound to come to trouble. Another type that is in difficulties most of the time is the person who lacks the willpower or courage to make any major decisions. They depend upon others to do their thinking for them. In this way, they allow other people to be the source of the psychic allergies from which most of us suffer to some degree. The person who tries to get away from the responsibility of decision is building trouble because he is now going to depend upon some other person's opinion for a decision he should make himself. The other person may say to him, well, if I was you, but that's where the rub comes in. The other person is not you. And what might be perfectly normal and natural for them is merely another allergy for you. We cannot depend even upon expert counseling to take the place of personal decisions made with strength of character. Another very important factor in this type of problem is the essential uh, psychic concept which we all have about ourselves. Each of us, one way or another, tries to answer the question, Who am I? This is not an easy question to answer. For the most part, this thing that we call I is an ego, which is an accumulation of pressures. Buddha probably came nearer than anyone else to giving a proper estimation of the nature of I. I being a summary of the reflexes of the sensory perceptions brought together by the mental coordinator. Therefore, the I is not an infallible divine being inside of us. It's pretty obvious that it's not infallible because if it was the one source of life in all of us, there could be no differences of opinion. If the power within us was absolute, we could never be in trouble. But it's not absolute, and it is not a preventative of trouble. In fact, it communicates trouble to most of its own parts in the course of years. But if it is a coordinator factor, if it is something that brings together a whole series of intensities and impulses, uh, dramatized by the five sensory perceptions, then this thing I call myself is very largely merely a summation of my complex temperament. This I is not only uh, a mental entity, but it is a highly conditioned entity. It is an entity which is always going to do what we want it to. It is always going to want to be what we decide it wants to be. And the person, when he says I, is not speaking from a point of great wisdom or infallibility. He is simply telling the story of his own nature and all the allergies that are locked in it. Very often the ego is simply defending an allergy or defending a concept or trying to prove the validity of an antagonism. Very often it takes years for an individual to prove just how bad his enemy is. I know cases in which it took three generations to make a real fiend out of an adversary. <laughs> and all this time the adversary didn't know anything about it. <laughs> the individuals who hated were sick. The object of the hate could care less made no particular difference, they were sorry. 
they may never have found out why they were hated. But one generation after another fed an antagonism until it became a family heritage <laughs> and affected children and their children to the third and fourth generation. Wherever we find these peculiar weeds growing in our garden, we can get rid of them as quickly as possible if we want to attain a better and more lasting piece of soul. Actually, allergies fall into a number of viewpoints at the moment. I think we may say safely that one of the greatest allergy mechanisms of the modern world is television. With that, we almost certainly can be sick in a comparatively short time. <laughs> we take on all kinds of attitudes, and the worst part of it is that we are more likely, by nature, to believe that which is morbid, unhealthy, or unreasonable than to enjoy anything that is pleasant. A good, solidly established neurotic will turn off anything that looks as though it might have a happy ending. <laughs> they just won't permit it. But if they can see suffering uh, beyond all words, suffering that it took four authors and two publicity people to put together, <laughs> then they know they're in the presence of, presence of sovereign truth. And they identify always with the most afflicted member of the caste. <laughs> now this addiction is worse than the inevitable effort to get French pastry into every meal. French pastry at least looks well. And most of the programs do not even look well. And in recent years, the members of the caste have been miserably dressed. Nothing about it is really pleasant. But we are glued to it. We feel that it is absolutely necessary. And day by day in every way, the whole world is being sickened by it. In this sense of the word, therefore, uh, here, is a, here is an object to which the whole world should be allergic. Should use the greatest discrimination to try and find what is reasonable and what is true. And uh, one of the reasons the whole world today is in a fa in a, almost in an hysteria is because it is constantly being fed by exaggerations, misinterpretations, and corruptions of one kind or another. Now next, perhaps, to this particular problem is the society in which we live. Uh, actually, every, use, every human being is allergic to narcotics. Uh, narcotic problems today are all out of hand. The individual perfectly willing to l destroy his own future in order to have a moment of exhilaration or to feel wonderful for a couple of hours. This situation is becoming a world menace. All the publicity, all the efforts that are being made to cope with it have failed because the individual is more concerned with a moment of superior attitude than he is in being alive in a few weeks later. This type of dr drug allergy has, has its equivalents also in, have it in their, our psychological life. We are constantly endangering everything that is valuable in the effort to attain some kind of temporary uh, result that pleases us. Out of this has come all kinds of activisms, all kinds of anarchy, everything that is possible to dramatize life and cause it to escape from the uh, boundaries of common sense. One of the reasons we have so much violence in the world today is because most people have nothing constructive on their minds. They do not even want to think straight. They want to do what the drug addict does, have a high for a few minutes. So for a high, they have a riot or an outbreak of assassination or they step walk into somebody else's country. This is an emotional reaction. It is an self-expression 
from a person or groups of persons who have nothing in themselves worth expressing, and having no constructive attitude, follow the well-known advice or recommendation of the past, or what my grandmother always used to say, the devil finds something for idle hands to do. And the world is full of idle hands, and things are out of control. So the person who wants to get over his allergies must have something on his mind, some way of life that is more important than an allergic addiction. Philosophy can help him. It can give him a reason for life. It can make things important that are important. It can help him to be a straight person regardless of the environment in which he finds himself. The struggle against environment is very difficult, but it can be won. The individual, no matter what happens around him, is still capable of living his own life as he should live it. The Greeks were aware of this. They took every type of persecution rather than compromise their principles, and some of them went to martyrdom to, rather than to for, uh, forbear uh, from the things that they knew to be right. Socrates died for that. Christ was crucified for that. But actually, the individual is capable at all times of living a constructive life if he is going to be stronger than temptation. If temptation can move him in a very short time to something that is not right, then he is weak. Weakness opens him to everything. It opens him to bad advice which he doesn't understand. So we have people coming to us all the time with problems resulting from lack of understanding. Now we find a person who has lived 50 or 60 years in this world and comes for advice because they do not understand the simplest problems of daily existence. How they managed to get as old as they did without learning anything is something of a mystery. But it can be achieved if you make a career out of it. <laughs> if you make certain that you do not learn, will not change, and continue to sit tight in the position that you are in now, you can gradually rock your way into a comparatively comfortable grave. But you are not going to have anything. And somewhere in the great plan of things, you're going to have to come back and do it again and keep on doing it until you do it right. Nature says we're going to grow. Most of our troubles today are resistance to growth. They are an effort to perpetuate something that was not right in the first place, and most people are much rather, rather die for their mistakes than live for their virtues. And until they do it that way, until they do better, you just have trouble. Now, another type of allergy that we have to constantly work with is this mysterious problem of what we should believe. Actually, uh, junk foods also exist in education. Most of our modern education is just about as near to junk food as we'll ever come. We can learn more and more about less and less than at any time in the history of the human race. Now, as a cure for everything, we're going to computerize life, and we're going to depend upon machines to do our thinking for us, although a computer expert reminded me only a few days ago that regardless of our optimism, it is beyond doubt true that no computer will ever be able to think. But if you don't think yourself, you get along all right with a machine that doesn't do any better. <laughs> you can feed in one group of mistakes and get out another series of mistakes that, is, that are going to please you completely. They're going to prove largely that what you wanted to know is right because you fed the information in that way to make sure that it would. <laughs> if this goes on, we will lose all reading, writing, and arithmetic out of the educational system. We will have individuals that will graduate without being able to spell their own names and will require a phonic computer to, to sign for them. 
this type of thing is just another example of an individual being over-indoctrinated with junk. Now, computers have their use, but that every child today should become a computer expert that will keep his mind off of the realities of life, but will not protect him from any emergency that arises in his personal affairs. He can learn all the computerization that he wants to, but he will not have a good home unless he does a little thinking. He has to do his own living. So the computer is something to which we can become addicted just as we are addicted to an unfortunate diet. The computer is a lazy solution to something. It is the individual continually trying to escape from his, the use of his own faculties. It, for a time, we kind of resented being forced to use our hands all the time, plowing and doing all this type of thing. We had to work hard. Then we went into a condition in which we had to use our minds in order to get by. They weren't very good, and we got into a lot of trouble with them, but we got tired of thinking. Now we want a machine that will do it for us. And it will do it for us, all right, and we'll end up in a great deal of trouble. Nature has given us a, a job. It has given us a series of situations. It has placed us in a garden. And in this garden are weeds, valuable plants, beautiful flowers, and poison ivy. And it all depends on what we do with it and what use we make of these facilities, what we learn from experience. Any individual who has had a series of tragic experiences must have learned something or else his life is very, very poor. He must have some gain to justify his existence in this world. Now, if you have things around you that you just can't stand, then the thing to do is now look into them and see what they are and try to find out why you can't stand them. If they're really wrong, you shouldn't have tolerated them as long as you have. If there's a potential good in them, you should get at it immediately. If you can see a way in which a problem is a challenge, and that you have followed your own feelings for a long time and the problem is no better and perhaps worse. If this be the case, then the challenge is solution. You must find out why. You must get an answer. Sometimes getting an answer requires a little humility. Sometimes we have to admit that we are wrong. We have to apologize for our own actions instead of demanding that somebody else apologizes. But whatever is necessary to put the thing in order must be done because the final end of the whole problem, problem individually and collectively, is that we can live together in peace and common constructive relationship. While we are breaking up these patterns of security constantly, we are in trouble all the time. Another type of allergy that comes along in connection with my, our psychic integration is our belief and its relationship to life. You know, in the old days, people's beliefs were comparatively simple. Of course, in times when no one really lived outside of the little neighborhood in which he was born, or at least didn't wander very far and hurried home, uh, beliefs were more or less orthodox, regular, and the believer was part of a community in which most people believed the same way. He went to the little church, and uh, there he met his neighbors, there he had beliefs that were similar to theirs, and he lived in a community in which the overall believing determined respectability. The individual who didn't live at least as well as the minister required was just in trouble. People did not want to be ashamed of themselves. They were therefore perhaps a little too tight, we'll admit that. They were a little too much inclined to their orthodoxies. But there was a mutual strength from the fact that the community followed as best it could the golden rule in the Sermon on the Mount. 
It didn't, act, it didn't interpret these things. It didn't have any deep insight or understanding. But it just lived according to the letter of the scripture. Now this has all changed. Today we have very little of the community religious life that was known to our ancestors. We have many new religious movements rising all the time each one of which exists only because there is a little difference between it and the others. Sometimes that difference is so little you can hardly find it, but it's still there. And people be become addicted to these different beliefs as they do to simply diet programs. If you want to really diet, all you have to do is to pick up a half a dozen of our prominent magazines and read the appropriate ads and you will find a number of ways which, if you try them all, will end in premature death. You will find that no two seem to agree what is necessary. All of them are infallible. All of them are harmless, and nearly all of them are impossible. So the person has a whole series of nutritional recommendations. How he should eat, what he should eat, what uh, support he needs, all about the vitamins and the minerals. He is given a long and elaborate description of all the things necessary to his physical health. On the psychological level, we have religions, philosophies, groups, ethical centers, political differentiations, social orders, every type of subject from the protection of the ecology to the preservation of local farmhouses. All of this is part of a system. And this is where the psychological phase of our life control comes in. These various groups have gradually usurped our religious allegiances. We are, our, our religion today is very sketchy. And in many churches, if you go, you'll find most of the sermons devoted to political or social problems. The old idea of religion for its own sake has disappeared. And religious buildings, churches, no longer resemble places of God. They look very much more like banks or other public buildings. The old way of simple devotion has vanished. On the physical plane, that simple devotion was three square meals a day, cooked at home from pure ingredients. Psychologically, the preservation was simple faith, simple believing, and hard work. All these together made the individual industrious, self-respecting, and tired when night came. Most of our ancestors couldn't stay awake late enough to uh, listen to the average television performance. They were pre we were prevented. We might, must have now the skill to prevent it ourselves. But as a result of these psychological recommendations, our mental and emotional health can also get into serious complications. We are given all kinds of remedies. We are given everything you can think of, uh, very much in the spirit of the pharmacology of medicine. Very, very often, a doctor will try to treat a mental or emotional ailment with physical drugs. Perhaps it's all he knows about the subject. Very few physicians are even good nutritionists. But today we are trying to use uh, the psychological uh, teachings which may be allergic to us. They may not be what we need at all. In order to find out what we need, sometimes it is necessary to gradually find out what we do not need. Most of the old Chinese and Hindu and Egyptian philosophers felt that the beginning of the good life was to get down to basics. And basics in this case would be a complete study of ourselves. What are we, really? As old Reynold Blight, who was the second preacher of the Church of the People that I later inherited, uh, the uh, Blight said that every individual should say to himself or ask himself, what am I worth if I lose everything I have? Now this is a big question. Most people would feel a little unhappy about it, I suspect. But actually possessions uh, 
have had very little effect upon the ennobling of character. In fact, the more wealth we have, the more apt we are to become dissipated or indifferent to the real values of living. So each person must, for, uh, for general practice, find out the basics of his own nature. He must find out what is underneath all the fluff and frills of acquired external pressures and environmental con contributions. What is the person inside? Has he an integration which will enable him to handle wealth? A person without internal integrities will always abuse what he has. And the world is full of wealth without responsibility, without integrity, or without enlightened understanding of right use. So if we're going to, if we're going to find out how to build a successful life and get over the pressures that distort it, we have to also learn to filter out false teachings, unreasonable attitudes, and mistaken educational policies. The problem of getting children through school is becoming more and more difficult, not altogether because children are becoming impossible, but because the children are not given anything that is of value. They know before they get out of school that they are just as ignorant of value as when they went in. That they have been able to take 10 or 12 years of education and graduate without the slightest understanding of why honesty is important. Something is wrong. We are being fed the wrong diet, psychologically. And because of that, we are producing individuals burdened throughout their lives with various mental and emotional allergies which should have been corrected at home or certainly brought in line in the higher phases of education. It is just simply lack of realization of self-value. Uh, many people really believe that, uh, the, that we are just a piece of putty and that anybody and everybody can shape it according to their way in which it should be. We have no sense of an identity which is capable of transcending pressure. We have no realization that within us is something that is capable of be amounting to something. And for lack of that, we have no incentives. Also, the industrial economic world in which we find ourselves is not inspiring in any sense of the word. The individual has very little opportunity to develop or express personal integrities. He is gradually molded into a product. His value lies entirely in a certain skill or in a certain ability, and the rest of his life is meaningless. This was pretty bad when there was a strong home life. Since that has failed, there is nothing left to bring the person into a maturity of inner thinking and feeling. So, what can we do? We have to gradually stand away from all of the situation and do that which we know inside we ought to do. And we have to face the problem of supporting in every way that we can, really supporting, uh, that which we know will help, instead of being willing to drift along in the present pattern of things. The, the modern world problem is all actually a composite psychic allergy. We have dumped indigestible elements into the social structure for ages, and it is sick. It is very seriously ill. And if life consisted of this social project alone, we would be doomed. But this social project is, is simply a sickness brought on which cannot destroy the life in us, but can make it very difficult to endure. The actual life within us, the, the kernel of eternity that is locked within our own natures, is immortal. Nothing can destroy it. Nations can come and go. Empires can rise and fall. Even the most horrible nuclear war cannot destroy the eternal, inevitable, divine spark in any living thing. We can destroy the bodies of things, 
We can destroy the bodies of insects, but we cannot destroy the life in them. But we throw this life out of the body, which it would naturally inhabit, and turn the world into a graveyard of shells, the spirits of which have been forced out of manifestation. We do not need to worry about being destroyed. What we need to worry about is being delayed, of being variously conditioned against the reasons for life. We cannot be prevented from that eternal growth, but nature, if it's necessary, may destroy an environment which man himself is no longer the skill to control. Unless we do it, nature will do it. And nature does not play favorites. Nature rewards only virtue. Nature provides security only to that which deserves it. Therefore, we all of us must become more and more deserving. And in order to do that, we must become more and more involved in values. If we are not able, by virtue of background or of present condition, of making some major com com uh, gift or contribution to life, then we serve God, perhaps, by releasing the God in ourselves most adequately and most immediately. This is a job we can all face. We cannot change the course of history, but we can change the course of personal biography, and it's about time to give this a great deal of serious thought. Now, when we look over the problem of ourselves, we may get to be a little discouraged we realize we've come a long way along the path of time without accomplishing very much. Also, that if the truth were known, when it comes to making a decision, we're simply bewildered. We're not at all sure what we ought to believe. We're not sure how we ought to live our lives. We are not sure how much we should spoil other people or should allow other people to spoil us. We don't know whether we are kind to our children by not punishing them, or cruel to them if we give them a thrashing once in a while. We really do not know what to do. I have people come to me all the time and ask me what church they ought to go to. They don't know. Also, they would like very much to know the best reducing diet, and I'm an expert on that. <laughs> but, <laughs> in other words, there is always questioning. People do not solve their own problems. They're, they don't. They feel they're not apt, able to do it. Well, if there is some simple general problem that you face, even one out of another, a dozen or more that you know are there, take one and go to work and educate yourself toward a solution. If there's something you want to do that is worth doing, find out how to do it. And also learn how to do it correctly realizing that in order to, to accomplish anything correctly, we've got to roll up our sleeves and do it ourselves. If we will work this way, we will get some action. So if, for instance, you have dissatisfaction with your internal life, if you would like to know more about art or music or philosophy or medicine or any subject, then the thing to do is to so regulate your affairs that you have time to do the things that you want to do and that the things you want to do are worth doing. The individual who lives their whole life wishing that something could be done usually dies without doing it, as in the famous example of Dickens' character of Wilkins Macaba. Actually, if you want to educate yourself, do so. If you want to learn philosophy, learn it. If you do not have the facility or the ability to do it all by yourself, tie into a pattern that is doing it and learn. Choose what you're going to do. Choose how you want to learn. Set aside the time necessary for self-improvement. And give up a lot of things that improve nothing, but which have become time killers throughout your life. Also, you can find tremendous opportunities for one of the most important service labors in the world, and that is helping. There is nearly always someone we can help, but we have to be awfully careful why we do it. 
if we if we want to help in order that we can be appreciated we have missed everything if we want to help and then turn around and try to have the other person do us a favor in return because we deserve it we have lost everything these ulterior motives the moment they show up are psychic allergies they will destroy a good deed instantly and will reduce this personal satisfaction in your own consciousness of having done something worthwhile so it is for only for the good deed for its own sake that we are in con we are concerned a good deed is allowing the God in you to work naturally the deity in each of us wants to use us as instruments for the manifestation of the divine plan when we use it this way then we get away from the egotism because we suddenly realize that it is not ourselves but the father in us that doeth the works and as soon as we get that way we give humbly realizing that we, the fact that we have done it right is simply the fact that we have been what we ought to be and that we have given a fair opportunity for the better part of ourselves to be revealed as soon as we get out of the commercialization of our own conscience we we'll get a long way towards solving the problems of our personal lives so therefore always bear in mind that a life is in some sort of way a kind of continuing prayer the individual is either cursing or praying most of his life he doesn't realize it and doesn't know it but everything we do is either in honor of truth or against truth one or the other there are very little there's very little neutrality because laziness is against truth to do nothing is not the answer but to do something and do it well not only brings proof of dedication but some way it improves health there are people who have learned from personal experience uh, that habits like allergies become more nagging uh, with the advancement of years a young person eating all kinds of carbonated uh, drinks and foods and pastries and candies and all these things seems to go along pretty well on them in the early teens or in the in the late years of childhood in fact the peer group prevents any other policy from enduring but as you get older if the appetites do not mature and become more reasonable first thing you know the little aches and pains begin to appear and you go to some uh, dietitian or specialist and they tell you that your diet isn't doing you any good that the time has come to think in terms of nutrition rather than simple terms of enjoyment so you find that it is necessary to change your ways or else your bad dietetic practices are going to be the finish of you now it's the same is true with the psychic allergies while we're young we can make all kinds of mistakes and seem to live through them we have if we have poor relationships with life we come under the influence of persons who are not responsible and yet in many instances we seem to drift along and we're fairly respectable people majority of persons are as respectable as their background protects actually however as we get older these psychic allergies begin to cut into health and more and more we are realizing that physical ailments are mostly the sh long shadows of psychic debilities that nearly every physical ailment has a psychological origin and that gradually this psychological origin so conditions the person's mind that he abuses the body does what is not wise or right and then the sickness starts so with this type of problem as we quietly take on problems solve them and transform pressures into enlightened consequences the body does enjoy the benefits 
A good emotional integration is one of the best foundations for physical health. The moment the person is inwardly disturbed, the physical system rises to meet the disturbance. If it is invaded by bacteria, it rises against that. If it is invaded by psychic errors, it rises against them. The psychology tries to protect us. We are endowed with processes and functions to protect us from ourselves if necessary. But there comes a time in physical problems when adrenaline gives out. There comes a time when our mistakes are so numerous that there is not enough energy left in us to repair the damage and sickness sets in, becoming probably chronic and ultimately shortening life. In the same way with mental and emotional pressures. If the individual has emotional pressures within reason, nature can take care of them. A person who is bereaved will be given strength through period of grief. An individual who has an unhappy or tragic event in their lives is expected to be a bit of a sufferer. They are bound to feel it for a time. But nature steps in and takes care of it if the person is sound underneath. An individual with a good solid background will rise above almost any emergency that comes along. It is not that they do not have feeling. It is not that they may not grieve. But it is that gradually they will transmute the negative aspects of their own emotions by virtue of the insight which they have. And it is in this that true religion and true philosophy become a tremendous protector of the physical life of the individual. If, however, the person simply decides to settle back and wallow in grief for the rest of their lives, they can do so, but they're going to pay for it. Exaggerated grief is an evidence of poor philosophy and poor religion. It is a proof that the individual is not living from a firm background or base within himself. We all have to suffer occasionally, but there is also constant recuperation taking place both physically and metaphysically, if we give it a chance. If we do not give it a chance, we have to live with the consequences. If we therefore are able to put our psychic integration into proper relationship with life, we will have it much easier and we will be happier and healthier and will have greater opportunity and strength to do the things we want to do. One of the problems of allergies is that they reduce stamina. By uh, dietetic allergy we reduce function and we reduce the enthusiasm of life. The body becomes tired more easily. It becomes disappointed more easily. And the tired person with a physical allergy is more likely to go into some form of neurotic condition. Now it is also the same way with the psychic allergies. The individual who permits them to take over gradually diminishes his own vitality. He becomes less capable of doing the things well. Many individuals under a neurotic pressure lose employment. They lose opportunities for advancement and a bad dispositional sickness can corrupt practically every aspect of life that is worth living. Many a broken home is nothing but a physical or a psychical allergy in action. It is destroying things which it cannot restore. And this destruction is simply due to lack of integrity and the courage to stand against a mistaken procedure. The moment we find out what is causing a problem, we must go after the cure. One uh, common cause, for example, is a bad memory. Memory can be a wonderful aid. Memory has given us everything that is important in life, as far as we are concerned. A person suffering from amnesia has destroyed almost all of the psychological powers of integration with which we are endowed. A memory, however, can be a very dangerous thing. A memory is very dangerous uh, at the moment to when we try to discover 
who discovered a country and who it belongs to. Uh, if we had no memory of the situation, we'd probably be better off. But we now have memories in countries of invasions time after time after time. We see countries that have been overrun 10, 12, 15 times in the course of history. And as a result is, the country's memory is very uncomfortable. It is distorted and possessed with all kinds of antagonisms and with all kinds of misunderstandings. A little reality and a great deal of exaggeration, and the result is chaos. Now, it is the same way with ourselves. Many of us are really suffering acutely from our memories. Memories can be allergic. A man is allergic to his memories. It is quite possible for an individual to pass through an entire lifetime nursing a grievance. It is possible never to be able to get over the antagonism we feel towards a person because of one or two incidents 25 or 35 years ago. I've, come to, I've had people come to me who couldn't get along with a brother or a sister because of some unhappy occurrence. They hadn't spoken for 25 or 30 years. Very often if you ask the person, now well, what was the original incident that started all this? I've had them look at me blandly and say, I've forgotten. <laughs> they don't remember the incident anymore. They don't remember what happened. But they remember they ought to feel bad about it. <laughs> so memories can be very inconvenient things. Now there are all kinds of ways of working with a memory. Unfortunately, we cannot forget without forgetting too much. In fact, it's only when the memory fails that a lot of our problems start. So we can't get rid of, rid of it that way. But what we can do with a memory is make a textbook lesson out of it. We can look over the memory carefully and transmute it from a misery into an opportunity to understand some factor of life that is important to us. We can use a bad memory as a means of releasing ourselves from a bad habit. We can find ways to transmute a, a difficulty into a constructive experience. At the time, we may not have learned. Thirty years later, we haven't learned. But the day we wake up to the facts, we have learned. And it's never too late to start. So that anyone who is carrying negative attitudes toward other people should do everything possible to transform that, those attitudes into constructive experience factors. To finally impersonally view these incidents and learn to grow from them. Until finally, maybe we will be grateful to the person we have hated for half a lifetime because we simply didn't learn a lesson. And sometimes, unfortunately, we were to blame in the first place. So it is to learn all of these tricks and, tru and truths that help us to learn to use our own faculties against false uh, processes that arise in thinking and in emotion. If we have to wait until we have the perfect diet physically, we probably won't last that long. We're going to go too soon. Because some of the things to which we are allergic really seem to protect us from complete starvation. But in psychical matters, we can rise uh, to the discrimination which will enable us to say, this is good for me. This is not good for me. This I can do without interfering with my own growth. This I can do which will enable me to help other people. This I can do because my philosophy of life tells me it is best. And another one, this I cannot do because I have done it many times and it has hurt me and endangered me every time. Or this I will not attempt again because it has failed. And something else comes along and we say, well, I was an alcoholic and I tried to defend it and I denied I was an alcoholic and I came very close to dying as an alcoholic. But because of a quiet heart-to-heart -heart talk with myself, 
or because a religion or philosophy came into my life that was stronger than the habit. I have corrected it and I'm going and I'm going on my way with a clean slate. We can solve every problem if we determine to do so. We can overcome every antagonism if we are willing to live by the simple biblical admonition, do good to those who despitefully use you. Now this sounds awful platitudinous, and a great many moderns consider it ridiculous. But in the sober fact, the Sermon on the Mount is one of the greatest systems of psychotherapy that has ever been given. It is the one that tells us that when we do it right ourselves, and when our dedications are right, heaven is with us. And to have heaven with us is more important than having all the world with us if we do wrong so that we can gradually get rid of psychic allergies if we will follow the admonitions of not only our own scriptures, but the scriptures of other people throughout the world. They all tell us to love one another. They all tell us to be kind, to be just, uh, to serve each other lovingly and with friendship. They all teach us uh, to rise above selfishness and to place our faith where it is properly placed in the spirit within us and in the spirit within space. If we face and love God and work with each other, if we follow the way of heaven, if we keep the rules, they will keep us and we will live long in the land which the Lord our God gave us. But if we keep on being foolish, even if the land endures, we won't. And it's much better for the individual to realize that most of his existence is out of this world. That it is far more important for him to build into the integrity of the universe than it is to satisfy his own ambitions here. If we live right here, we are right forever. If we live wrong here, we will be spanked and sent back to try again. All of which is a little more difficult. The best thing to do is to start immediately to make any correction which will enable us to live better and more constructive lives. Uh, I'd like to announce at this time that at one o'clock we're going to have a little memorial service here in the auditorium and we will hope that you will all be here to uh, join us in a tribute to Holly Freeman, who has been a very faithful friend for many years. I would also like to point out that there will be a, a funeral service for Holly uh, at the Utter McKinley Mortuary Parlors in uh, Glendale at 2 o'clock, and I will also conduct that service. We thank you for being with us this morning and hope to see you at 1 o'clock.